remaining 10 slides. Okay, 24 to 34. So on Saturday, we won't need so much. There was a, a bell ringing. <laughs> anyway, uh, well, uh, we will close this presentation anyway on Saturday, Saturday morning. Um, well, regarding time on Saturday, I, I, if you if you uh, if you're okay with that, I would suggest to start at 10:30, 10:30 on Saturday. We will very probably have only one hour lesson and one, uh, and, uh, one hour lesson on Saturday, or perhaps one and a half. I will decide. I will decide on Saturday. But we have now to start today with the uh, with the presentation again because we have 14 slides today because you, we have to close the uh, you know the unit uh, the, the the chapter. Well, um, I will remind you again about time to start on Saturday before we close today. But again, 10:30 Saturday, 10:30 in the morning, not in the night. Okay. Well. Uh, let's let's get back to the uh, presentation of yesterday, and please open slide eleven. Uh, in this unit now, we will be speaking about. We will discuss the period. I mean, the, this was the most successful period. Tasnim, Saturday next class. Yes, ten thirty Saturday next class. We will close on Saturday at least this presentation. Okay, this is my plan. Uh, well, uh, the period 1999 to 2007, 2008, approximately, uh, because 2008, as you perhaps remember, or you know perhaps from uh, from uh, sources, uh, uh, or you have read that uh, 2008, there is a problem uh, in economy because of the global financial crisis exactly there was a crisis exactly 2008 is the beginning of the global financial crisis and we will i will give some more information about how this financial crisis began actually is it was one of the, the most severe financial crisis after the one you remember perhaps from european history from the course on the european history after the one of 1929 just before uh, um, Second World War or in the interwar period, you remember, we have been discussing in the course, in the history course about this event, the economic crisis, 1929, starting in the US. And um, this crisis now, 2008, started also in the US and sparked a global financial crisis. We'll be discussing, we will be discussing a bit more about this. Um, but the time 1999, especially 2000, 2001, or 2002 after the euro was launched until 2008, was so to say paradise on earth. It was really paradise on earth. There was no similar period in modern history uh, compared to that period in economic terms. I mean, it's not only in economic terms. I mean, terms, especially in terms of liquidity of money available, uh, 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 money money available in the global markets, financial markets. This was a boom of liquidity. And this boom of liquidity, actually, was the main reason for the crisis to begin in 2008, because this boom in liquidity in money available uh, was the reason for economic bubbles, for an economic bubble especially in the housing construction sector uh, in the US, especially in the US, where also the crisis began. So this was a paradise on earth. There was money available. Everybody was borrowing money, states anyway, because, you know, debt is not as such, it's not a sin. Debt as such is not bad. This is the way that the economy runs, actually, and this is how states finance their households, okay? Uh, in 2000 was the best time. Yes, the period 1999 to 2008. This was the best period ever in uh, modern history regarding um, financial issues. 
because a lot of money was available and it was very easy to get to get a loan to get a loan from a bank regardless if you are a state or if you are a single person you know i still remember especially in countries like like greece when i visited greece during that time during this period i still remember advertisement to borrow money everywhere banks made advertisement addressing single citizens to borrow money to get loans for, uh, for whatever you want i mean for for vacation to buy a car to buy uh, furnitures to whatever you want um, so it was very easy to borrow money but <laughs> the problem is especially regarding uh, citizens the problem is that citizens uh, uh, i don't know why but i had the feeling the the weren't aware of the fact that loan is a debt. A loan is a debt. When you get a loan, you have to, to pay the money back. <laughs> uh, I had the feeling that, that citizens uh, have not been aware about this, this, this fact that, uh, okay, you can borrow money from the bank very, very easily to make vacation in, uh, I don't know, to make vacation in, uh, in India. Uh, but uh, you have to pay this money back and uh, what what was additionally the problem was that um, the interest to be paid uh, if you get a loan at the time interest was very high we speak about really in, in comparison to today after the crisis a very high interest to be paid by everybody regardless if states or citizens single citizens and sometimes you have to pay interest over interest. So the money to be paid back was much higher than the loan itself. So people didn't care somehow. This was my feeling at the time and my feeling was right because 2008 we did have a crisis, especially then in Greece 2010, as of 2010, because of additional reasons too, not only because of the financial crisis. I will tell you more. Of borrowing to invest by housing planning. Uh, yes, I will tell you more about this, how the, the, the crisis began, but the problem was in the housing sector in the U.S. Uh, but let's first uh, see what, what happened in, the, in, the, in Europe, I mean within the Eurozone first, first of all, before coming to this crisis. Because we will speak about the crisis uh, on Saturday, I guess, because this is the unit, the, la the last unit is about the crisis, an overview about the crisis, because the second presentation we will have on Sunday, uh, we will start on Sunday with that, uh, the second presentation is more focused on the crisis. This is why I will leave this issue, how this global crisis, financial crisis began. I will leave it for Sunday, actually, because uh, on the basis of the second presentation, we will have the opportunity to speak more about this, more specifically about this. This is why now I will make first an overview about first this time of, uh, of uh, high wealth, 1999-2008. Um, uh, in this period, as it uh, goes uh, on the slide, the Eurozone enjoyed a period of economic growth and stability. In this section, we review this period. First of all, we have to speak now about a, uh, an institution we didn't speak a lot about in the uh, last uh, two uh, uh, courses, namely the European Central Bank. Uh, the location of the European Central Bank, I mean, this is in a, as was said yesterday, it was a, a new institution launched by the Treaty of Maastricht within the Monetary, the Economic and Monetary Union to manage the Eurozone. So the European Central Bank uh, was uh, located in Frankfurt. And this is not a coincidence why Frankfurt, why Germany and Frankfurt. Um, of course, I mean Germany because uh, this is the biggest economy and uh, the Germans, they have to to define, uh, you know, a lot of uh, economic policies, uh, or they have the right, actually, the unwritten, if you want, right, to define more in economic policies in the EU than other states. And secondly, because Frankfurt was, and still is, uh, the center of uh, financial business in, uh, in Germany. Um, it is a testament, the European Central Bank, it is a testament to the strong influence of German monetary policy earned on account of the exemplary performance to the German economy and especially its monetary policy from 1950 to 1919. We will speak more about this in the uh, coming lessons. 
But let's now just have only an overview, okay? Because if we go into more details, then we will not finish our 14 slides today. Well, slides 12. Key features of the ECB, instrument and goals. I will just go through the slide by reading, by re just reading it, and I will agree again, add the one or other element, or uh, I will add some comments if necessary. Instrument and goals. The instrument used by the ECB is the interest rate at which banks can borrow funds, can borrow money. You know, this is a very important thing in, uh, in economy. Uh, the banks, how this works, very, very generally described, okay? The banks borrow money from the central bank. Uh, I mean, at the national level, from the national, of course, central bank. In this case, banks can borrow money from the ECB directly. And the interest rate plays a big role. And just because banks then, they borrow that money to citizens, to companies in order to, you know, to finance different things from consumption to buy things to investment. So this is a this is this is in general how the how economy works and how the financial sector works. Okay. Um, and the interest rate plays a big role. We are just now, by the way, let let me make let me please make a very short comment. We are just now uh, amidst the uh, corona crisis, coronavirus crisis, and uh, President Trump but also uh, national leaders in, within the EU, they ask national banks to lower the interest rate because we are in a crisis again. And, and to be honest, by the way, I'm very afraid about what is, uh, what is coming to us in the, in the next weeks. I'm very afraid that we will have a severe financial crisis. Uh, the, the signs we have right now are not good. I mean, the, 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 the signs are worrying. I'm not sure, I'm not, I'm not confident at all that about the, um, the next months to come, I'm afraid that there will be a financial crisis uh, because of the coronavirus, because of national economies. They suffer, they suffer a lot. Alone, if you see what happens in the, uh, in the uh, airline sector, this is... Uh, <laughs> this, uh, it is a similar uh, crisis like the one we had some years ago with this volcano that exploded in, in, in Iceland. It's a similar situation. Alone Lufthansa, alone Lufthansa cancelled until the end of April 23,000 23, flights. So that's enough. Um, well, according to its charter, the ECB's primary objective is to maintain price stability, no inflation. No inflation. This is a very German attitude and approach. No inflation. Uh, Germans are uh, allergical with everything that has to do with inflation. And you can remember, or you can imagine well why, because of the experience Germans had in the interwar period during the Weimar Republic, uh, when uh, inflation reached uh, unthinkable levels. Um, you remember perhaps the example of three, three billion uh, um, uh, mark for one egg, buy one egg during that time. So maintain price stability is the main goal of the ECB and to support the general economic policies in the community. There is a difference, let me uh, add one more comment here, there's a difference if we compare the ECB, the European Central Bank, with the uh, Federal Reserve, which is the Central Bank of the US. Uh, the uh, difference here is, and this makes the difference between the, the EU and the US, by the way, the US is a federal state, the EU is a union, but not a federal state, it's not a single state. Uh, one additional element or, 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 or task to be fulfilled by the, uh, by the Federal Reserve in the US is to maintain price stability, but also to, uh, um, to uh, apply policies that secure jobs and create new jobs. This is not the task of the ECB at all. This, this is not a, a, a task to be fulfilled by the European Central Bank. The forbidden activities now, the ECB may not directly finance member states' fiscal deficits or to provide bailouts. Uh, there's no mandate to act as a lender, to, to, to borrow money, to borrow money to states 
this is not the uh, this has not be done by the uh, ECB and this was a big problem after the, the, uh, the financial crisis began in the eurozone in the EU 2010 with Greece was a very big problem because there was no possibility but by the way not only with Greece because uh, the financial crisis 2010 started with Greece only started and then affected uh, Portugal Spain uh, Ireland and finally Cyprus okay so there was no way for the ECB to help these countries to overcome this the debt problem they faced uh, uh, and I will tell you more uh, after Sunday Sunday Monday about this how this was solved this problem okay and of course, uh, you see the uh, final comment on the slide. All of that have been very controversial during the financial crisis 2010-16. I would say, I make, I will make a correction: 2018, not 16. I, I think we are, we, we, we managed to overcome the crisis since now just one and a half years, summer 2018, namely after Greece left this supportive mechanism of the EU. Well, let's now go to slide number 13. Uh, again, we are still in the same uh, subject, namely key features of the ECB, governance and decision making. Monetary policy decisions are made at meetings of the ECB's governing council, which consists of the central bank governors of the Eurozone national central banks and six members of the ECB's executive board. In practice, policy decisions are made by consensus rather than by majority. Meetings are usually held twice each month. Accountability and independence. No monetary policy powers are given to any other EU institution. No EU institution has any formal oversight of the ECB, and the ECB does not have to report to any political body. The ECB does not release the minutes of its meetings. The ECB has more independence than most central banks. Independence to politics. Okay, so uh, why why these strict regulations? Uh, you know, it's very important. We, we what we have to underline here. And this is underlined, by the way, on the slide, is that the ECB is totally independent independent from politics. And this, if we go now to, to uh, slide 14, um, actually, just a moment, go please to, to 16 first. Go to 16, slide 16. I have, I, I must change the, uh, the order of the slides here. This independence, you see on the slide here, slide 16, the German model, right? Uh, this, uh, this, especially regarding independence of the uh, European Central Bank to politics, uh, what applies here is the German model, uh, the German model, the title of the, of, the, of the slide is number 16, the German model, because it, uh, it uh, you know, it, it follows, I mean, you have to, we have discussed a bit about this element of, of total independence of the ECB to politics. This is exactly the model. Okay, no problem. Uh, this is exactly the, the, the model that applies to the... No, I mean, uh, the, the ECB, it is, it's very simple. The ECB was constructed according to the model of the Bundesbank. The, Bundes, the, the, the Bundesbank is the central, is the national central bank in Germany. And the ECB was just constructed according to the, this model, to the model of the Bundesbank. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons for the German economic power is, uh, has to do with the uh, national central bank, which is independent from politics, and always takes care of economy without taking care of politics. What politics mean to the to, to the policies the bank, the central bank applies. Okay, they do not ask any politician what should be done. They just do that 
to fulfill their tasks. And uh, one of the main tasks of the Bundesbank and one of the main tasks of the ECB again is to guarantee pl price stability. They don't ask politicians about that. They are, they are economists, all of them, the ones is possible. In the, um, the executive, uh, the executive um, council of the ECB and the directors of all national banks that belong to the ECB's council, general council, all of them are econ economists and they just apply the politics and the policies to be applied in order to secure, no. fulfill, to fulfill the task, which is uh, to, uh, to uh, secure price stability. They don't care about politics. They don't ask any politician and no politician is allowed to intervene in the work of the ECB. Okay? And this is exactly the German model how on how to construct a central bank. And this is one of the reasons, one of the, of, of the uh, yes, one of the reasons why the uh, German economy since the late 50s could develop so well. It has also to do with the role of the central bank. Okay? So now let's go back to slide number uh, 14 now. 14, please. Criticism of the ECB, because this is now a new, a new sub chapter. Number 14, criticism of the ECB. Well, the ECB has acted as if it places little weight on economic performance, growth, and unemployment. This is what I told you before. This is not a task of the ECB to secure employment, but this is a task compared. Uh, it is on the slide, by the way, it is, uh, as you know. In this area, the ECB's policy preferences are different from, say, those of the U.S. Federal Reserve, which has a mandate from Congress not only to ensure price stability, but also to achieve full employment, okay? This, is, this makes a big difference. And this makes a big difference, again, between the U.S. as a federal state and the European Union as a non yet single state, federal state, but just as a union of national states, okay? This makes a big difference. Uh, unemployment, uh, I mean, to secure employment, this is still a national policy. It has nothing to do with, uh, with um, uh, policies to be applied by the European Central Bank. Of course, of course, I must add to that, uh, to that, uh, to that fact, of course, during the crisis, the European Commission um, uh, launched new legislation in order to in order to uh, to uh, to finance uh, a number of different projects during the crisis 2010-18 to finance different projects in order to boost employment because countries like Greece, Spain, Portugal, etc. they suffered under high very high unemployment, especially Greece, by the way used to be during the crisis, it reached, it reached during the crisis uh, a percentage of 28% uh, unemployment, 28%, 2012, 13, 14. Now, I just read uh, some days ago, now it is down to 16, uh, but still very high, right? Anyway, this makes a big difference between, uh, again, between the ECB and the uh, US Federal Reserve. Um, there is a controversy over the strict interpretation of the forbidden activities rules. And this is a question now here that applies to the crisis. What happens in the event of a large banking, banking crisis in the Eurozone? Big crises could prove more difficult to prevent or contain. So this, is exactly the, this was exactly the question, again, uh, as the uh, Eurozone crisis spurred with Greece, Portugal, Spain, especially in 2010. There is a controversy also over the decision-making process. Consensus decisions may favor the status quo, causing policy to lag when it ought to move. I mean, you know, this is a very general, of course, problem of European affairs. As I told you yesterday, European diplomacy is very, very slow. And decision-making process, no, 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 it's not possible. It's not possible. They found other ways. I will tell you on Sunday, 
or I don't know, perhaps on Saturday, we start the new presentation about the euro zone and the euro crisis. I will tell you more, more how they uh, found a way, because this was strictly forbidden to bail out countries, strictly forbidden, uh, how they managed to, to do that. Uh, so the decision-making process is not a, a problem that regards, of course, only the ECB, it regards the EU as a whole, as you very well know. For example, you remember, if, if there's a case brought before the European Court of Justice, this, uh, this takes at least 18 months until this case is decided. At least. This is the, uh, this is the, <laughs> the limit by law. I mean, but most of the times it lasts more than 18 months. So, you know, everything lasts in the EU. By the way, democracy takes time. Right? Democracy, decision-making process in democracy in general takes time. Okay? If you in a dictatorship, the dictator makes a decision right away, within a minute, within five minutes, and the problem uh, is perhaps not solved, but <laughs> decision is there. Uh, but in democracy, democracy needs time, okay, because of procedures to be fulfilled in order to secure that we have a democratic decision. Very simple. But in the EU, this lasts a bit more, sometimes much more, because of uh, very specific conditions. Uh, if you have 27 now different states that have to decide about, about anything, uh, this takes time, I mean, you know, to, to make a kind of consensus. And still, but consensus in general is a problem. Consensus is a problem. Uh, all Europeans have realized that this is a problem, especially in, in times of crisis, when uh, decisions have to be, to be made very, very quickly. Consensus is a break, is a break, breaks decision making. And this is now why we started with a discussion within the EU to, to actually abolish consensus, the consensus, uh, and not in all policy areas, by the way, but uh, regarding financial issues, there must be a consensus in the, in the Council of Ministers, for example, okay? Uh, to abolish consensus and to replace it with, uh, with the majority vote, voting. Uh, there's no other way because, uh, you know, uh, especially during the crisis and after the crisis, there's enough evidence that consensus is a break that breaks decision making uh, to take to make decisions, uh, the right decisions uh, at the right moment. OK, well, let's go to number 15, slide number 15. Uh, this is a continuation of criticism to the construction of the uh, ECB. A very large council makes consensus more difficult to achieve, especially as more countries join the euro. But the structure of the council is set in the Maastricht Treaty and would be impossible to change without revising the treaty. Okay, this is a problem. There is a controversy. Yeah, well, because, you know, in order to modify, <laughs> this is a good question. If consensus is a problem, why the EU did modify it? Because in order to modify it, you need consensus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is the reason why. <laughs> you know, it's a vicious cycle, right? Uh, <laughs> well, there is controversy over the ECB's lack of accountability. Yes, thank you very much for your comments. <laughs> In order to, uh, to abolish consensus, consensus, you need consensus. So this, this is a very simple problem, but very difficult to be solved. Well, uh, there is a controversy over the ECB's lack of accountability. Uh, as I told you before, they don't, uh, they don't even, even publish the minutes of the, <laughs> of the meetings. Nothing. How decisions are made, nobody knows. What are the arguments? By, by whom? Nothing is known. Okay? Now we have, in order to, you know, to be, uh, to be more quick in decision-making, to prepare decisions for the ECB, uh, in order to, to speed up, to speed up uh, developments and, and decisions whenever, whenever uh, uh, necessary, 
especially during the uh, during the uh, euro crisis we have now one more additional is not foreseen in the treaty in the maastricht treaty was not foreseen and is, is, is an additional now institution that created the euro group um, that uh, comes together according to the needs i mean during the euro zone crisis 10 18 especially 10 15 because after 15 there is a as a kind of you know of, uh, more calm uh, times uh, 15 18 but uh, in this time this period of time f for four or five years the euro group sometimes was was uh, was meeting every week every week i still remember every week the euro group meeting to decide for this and that during the eurozone crisis okay uh, now we had slide 16 about the german model um, well, uh, now, actually, by the way, this slide was continued by slide 17. Uh, but this provides me now with the opportunity to tell you a bit more about German influence in the Eurozone um, in general. Well, uh, you know, most of the conditions is also underlined is underlined in the uh, on the slide most of the conditions for entering a monetary union i mean simply said the uh, regulations foreseen by the treaty of maastricht in terms of uh, when a country member state can join the eurozone most of the conditions and we will be speaking after that today about the conditions in order to be able to to enter the eurozone according to the treaty most of these conditions have been let's say more or less dictated by germany why by germany why why this this influence of germany strong influence you know it's very simple germany after unification 1990 and before launching the monetary union officially launching the monetary union with a, uh, in the frame of the Maastricht Treaty, Germany was the country to abolish the strongest currency, not only within Europe. It was at the time the second, uh, the most strong currency after the US dollar, the German mark. Okay, so you can imagine for a country to decide to abolish this currency, this strong currency, the second strongest currency in the world, and to join together with others <laughs> to, to join a currency uh, together with Slovenia, Slovakia, uh, Estland, uh, Lithuania, uh, Greece, and so on and so forth. By the way, Italy, okay, or even France, to join such a common uh, currency area with all these guys down there, especially in the south, this was very, very dangerous to German economy and to Germany in general. This is why the Germans, they could, they could, only, they could only agree to accept a common currency only under the condition that this new currency to be commonly accepted by more states in the European Union this currency will be at least will be at least as strong as the Deutsche Mark. At least, actually, yes, exactly. Actually, the uh, the uh, the conditions we will see now the conditions in the next slides. Actually, the conditions for entering the eurozone, meaning the structure of the euro as such, is so strict that actually managed to. Uh, but why the German take the risk of political benefit? Yes, this is a good question, okay. Why they took the risk? Uh, I will tell you why. <laughs> uh, okay, I mean in, in general terms, but uh, I will tell you. Um, uh, but, you know, the first thing was to accept a common currency with others, with weaker economies, okay? But to secure that this currency is as strong as the Deutsche Mark, and it is, well, right, it was from the very beginning stronger. 
Yes, you know, it's not only political, of course. It's not, uh, not only political. There are political and economic reasons, both. Um, so the, uh, the, 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 actually, the euro is stronger, indeed stronger. If you just see, if you just compare the uh, exchange rate, uh, what was the exchange rate between Deutsche Mark and the dollar, or between the Deutsche Mark and the, um, and the uh, uh, Japanese yen, for example, then you will realize that the, the euro, although today, right now, actually in the last month, is very weak, the rate is down, it is still stronger than the Deutsche Mark. So it was, it, it is, since launching the Euro 1999 uh, until today, the Euro is stronger in terms of exchange rates, right, than the Deutsche Mark. So it is a strong currency. It used to be, it, it remained a strong currency also during the crisis, by the way. Uh, it was stronger than the Deutsche Mark also during the financial crisis in, in the Eurozone. This is why the Germans, they had to secure to secure that we have conditions in the monetary union that can secure a stable and strong common currency in order for the Germans to join it. Now, what is the, uh, you know, what is the, uh, what are the events behind the scenes? You know, there is an anecdote. Uh, of course, this, this is just an anecdote and this didn't take place this way, but this anecdote describes actually what was the deal between Germany and the rest of Europe and the rest of the EU. Uh, after the collapse of the European, of the, of, the, of the Soviet Union, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, I mean, German politicians, especially Helmut Kohl, the uh, chancellor, German chancellor, chancellor at the time, they have realized this is now the right moment for the country to be unified again after Second World War. They have realized this chance, but this chance had to overcome two obstacles. Uh, the one obstacle was, of course, the Soviet Union, still present in Eastern Germany, also after the collapse. They still had an army there. This was the, uh, let's say, uh, to convince the, the Soviets or the Russians, after all, and to convince also the partners within the European Union. And this was more, this more difficult, by the way, to convince their own partners, not the Soviets, not the Russians, for reunification. And, of course, the Germans had especially to convince the French. Okay, we have been discussing in the European history course about, about the balance of power in Europe, and Germany always was a problem to this balance of power. It was, it was a, a difficult balance uh, in all, uh, at all levels and in all terms. I mean, uh, politically, economically, strategically, and so on and so forth. Okay? Uh, nobody, we, we didn't have by accident two, two, two world wars after unification of Germany in the late 19th century. This didn't happen by accident. It had to do with the place of Germany in Europe. With, with the position of Germany in Europe, definitely. And this was again the case. Germany had to unify again. This was the plan of the German, of German uh, politicians. So how to do that? They have to convince them that they will still be part of the process of European integration, that they will not uh, again try to, uh, to, uh, to uh, prevail over all other European countries. Okay? Uh, and this anecdote now goes like this. Uh, the deal between the former Chancellor Helmut Kohl and the um, French president at the time, François Mitterrand, was that Mitterrand told Kohl, this is an anecdote, okay, but you know, it describes the deal actually in general terms. Uh, Mitterrand told him, you will get uh, the whole country, whole Germany, and we will get from you the half of the Deutsche Mark, meaning the half of your economic power, by establishing a monetary union in which you will also participate. So we will have a common currency and we will profit from your economic growth from the Deutsche Mark. 
So this is actually what also happened in the end. Okay, Germany was unified. There was no opposition from the biggest uh, European states, especially from the French, but also from the UK. By the other states, anyway, there was no opposition, anyway. So, and in the end, as a matter of fact, all Europeans profited from the Euro, uh, just because behind the Euro was the abolishment of the Deutsche Mark, and the Deutsche Mark, uh, and the Euro was uh, established in a way to be stronger than the Deutsche Mark. Out of that, all Europeans profited in the end. But, you know, without being able in the end, and this is very important to be said, to avoid the crisis in 2010. And this has also to do with a strong euro. I will tell you on Sunday why. And this applies especially to Greece. Okay? Well, this is now what, for the time being, has to be said about the German model, about why Germany set most of the conditions for the monetary union. Because they abolished the strongest uh, currency in the world and joining, I mean, by, by joining the monetary union and Behind this, of course, also the uh, the uh, um, there were cells avoiding the Greek crisis. <laughs> yes, you know, if actually, uh, well, uh, if actually the uh, financial, the global financial crisis of 2008 wouldn't happen, wouldn't take place, if everything were would be fine, we wouldn't have a Greek crisis. And I will tell you a Sunday way, okay. <laughs> Because uh, this is connected to the global financial crisis, definitely, the financial crisis in the EU. Without the EU, the US crisis, in the housing, especially in the housing uh, sector, we wouldn't have the financial crisis in, in, in Europe. In none of the countries, not in Greece, not in Spain, not in Portugal, and so on and so forth. But this is uh, something I will explain or describe on uh, the basis of the second presentation. We, when it is about the, uh, the uh, financial crisis in the EU and the Eurozone crisis. Now, uh, let's go to number 18, slide number 18. Now we will uh, get into more details about the rules of the club. And the club here is the Eurozone. So the Maastricht Treaty established five rules for admission. Ah, Amal, hi, how are you? So you're able to join? Are, are you in Jordan? I was there uh, two days ago <laughs> in Amman. Well, welcome, welcome to the class. Well, uh, the Maastricht Treaty establishes the rules of the club. Uh, what should be fulfilled uh, from member states in order to be allowed be allowed to enter the Eurozone. Yeah. Uh, in my eyes, if you go now to slide 19, in my eyes, and not only my eyes, I mean, uh, you know, uh, specifically, what specifically, and this is the most important aspect of the criteria to, uh, to be fulfilled in order to join the Eurozone. Um, are the, are the two last criteria regarding government deficit and government debt. The last two ones in the list here on the slide. Meaning that in order to be able to join, okay, the, the national economy should not uh, exceed 3% of the GDP I mean, government de deficit, deficit in the household, in the annual household of the country, should not exceed 3% of the GDP of the previous financial year. And most importantly, uh, the government debt, this is the overall state debt, okay? So the one thing is the deficit, the annual deficit, 3%. The other thing is the overall state debt should not exceed 60% of the GDP of the previous financial year. This is the most strict regulations in order to, 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 be, to, to secure that we establish 
a stable and strong currency. In all states uh, participating in the Eurozone. Well, now, we will be speaking again and again about this criteria. Uh, these are not, uh, are not uh, you know, uh, they, they prove to be problematic from time to time, very problematic. Right now, for example, right now, because of the coronavirus crisis, uh, President Macron of uh, France started a discussion, I just read yesterday, started a discussion to abolish for some months the criterion of 3% of the GDP regarding government deficit. As you understand, especially this applies to Italy anyway, uh, harmed by this uh, crisis now, by the coronavirus crisis, uh, uh, very, very hardly harmed by it. Uh, but this applies to many other countries around Europe. Ah, by the way, have you read that uh, the US um, prohibited any flight from Europe for one month to the US? This will be a big, a big problem. But also, not only regarding passengers, uh, people, uh, but also regarding products. This will be a catastrophe. I mean, you know, we are just going ahead to face, uh, I think, a big financial crisis, economic crisis. Anyway, um, so the, uh, President Macron, I don't know, I'm not a prophet. You know, nobody, nobody can see. And this is a, actually this is a good question. You know, <laughs> I, I read from time to time. You know, most of the people believe that economics is a kind of natural science. Science economics is not a natural science. Economics is social science. Economics work with theories. Economic. You know, you have data and you try to understand the data and make predictions. But these predictions have, been, have to be corrected. And I always laugh with predictions by any economist in Germany at the global level, by the World Bank or whatever, regarding different issues. But they make predictions about, for example, national growth. We will have a national growth of in 2019 or 2020. Uh, of 1.75% uh, uh, after three months, they have to correct it down to 1.5 and so on and so forth. This is what is always done, and I'm just I always laugh with that because you know you make predictions according to the data that you have right now. What happens next? Nobody knows. Did someone uh, predict what will happen with the coronavirus in December? No, of course not. I mean, this is something that uh, took place more or less uh, suddenly. It was not, it was not uh, considered into the data, into the uh, predictions they made in December about uh, economic growth uh, 2020. Now they have to make corrections. And this goes like this all the time. You know, econ economics is not natural science. Science, they do not formulate natural rules that apply to all cases and times. This is social science. This is theory, nothing else. If neoliberalism is a good thing, uh, for states and the national economies, this is something theoretical. You can develop another theory that uh, denies that neoliberalism is a good approach to economy. Well, it depends. Well, so and this is the this is the case regarding these two criteria here. Why three percent of government deficit? Why sixty percent of uh, of government debt? This is something that was arbitrarily, totally arbitrarily defined. And of course, defined by the Germans because they want to secure that, you know, these are as low as possible levels of debt and deficit, as low as possible. 3% deficit annually, 60% overall state debt. This, these are very, very, very low rates, very, very low rules, this 3 and 60%. This could be 6% and this could be 80 or 90%. Okay? Nobody would say no. Why 90 and not 60? Nobody would say this. No economist would say this. So this is something arbitrarily uh, set in order to secure as low as possible levels of debt annually and overall debt. Okay? And this was a general, this was a German approach and a German demand to a great extent, okay? And now, I mean, during the financial crisis, 
2010, 16, 15, there was a lot of discussion of uh, making these rules more loose in order to invest more, or the states, the state invest more. What means this 3%? This means, it's very simple. I mean, why President Macron now discusses this, to increase, to abolish for some months, even to abolish it, this rule. Because the state, in, in, in times of crisis, the state has to invest more, has to invest money, meaning that has to borrow money, okay, from the financial markets, in order to to finance companies, for example, that that suffer loses because of the crisis now, the coronavirus crisis, uh, to enhance services in health, in the health system, and so on and so forth, to to hire more people in the health sector, which is the case now in many countries. I have read yesterday two thousand people are now hired by the Greek state in the health sector, because in order to face better the crisis, if it comes to a more severe crisis uh, because of the coronavirus. So, and this is money to be spent by the state, and the state has to borrow that money from the financial markets. So, if you borrow all that money for a period of time, for six months, for example, this year, this will increase the percentage uh, of uh, government deficit uh, in comparison to the GDP. This will be 6%, for example, okay? And this is what they want now to do. They want to abolish. This is the but, uh, this is the, the the proposal by the president of France right now to abolish this rule in order for the state to be able to react better to the current crisis. And this was not allowed, by the way, during the financial crisis. For ten years, it was not allowed for states to increase government deficit over three percent. Okay. I will tell you more on Sunday, on the basis of the second presentation, what the U.S. government did after the crisis in 2008, during namely the Obama administration. It was the first, uh, first or second, second I think, uh, or first uh, uh, office of President Obama. What the, the the Obama administration did in order to overcome the crisis, and this is exactly this. What they did was to increase state investment. Okay, I will get back to that. Well, now, uh, let's go to... Ah, okay, now this describes what I just now, uh, slide 20, what I just now uh, analyzed and a bit criticized too, okay? I, I criticized a bit. Permits member state to ensure the compliance to the criteria. Yes, 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 and this will be described in the ne next... Actually, this will be our last point, <laughs> uh, what, what improvements, what improvements have been made in order to better, uh, to better uh, control fiscal discipline, okay? Uh, during, the, during the crisis and after the crisis, we launched new measures in order to secure that this fiscal, uh, because it has to do with fiscal rules, okay? This 3% and 60% of deficit and debt, these are fiscal rules. And these rules have to do with fiscal discipline by everybody. And this is this will be now just because of the answer by Maher. This will be our last uh, consideration on the basis of the second presentation I have prepared for you, namely, which way the ECB now controls things better. Not only the ECB, by the way, because this is a policy affair, is a policy matter, and must be monitored monitored by the European Commission, right? Well, uh, now, fiscal, fiscal discipline. Um, the Maastricht Treaty saw the fundamental and deep causes of inflation as being not monetary, but fiscal. The other two Maastricht rules are openly aimed at constraining fiscal policy, 3 and 60%. The rules say <clears throat> that government debts and deficits cannot be above certain reference levels. Again, 3%, 60%. Although the treaty allows some exceptions, exactly. This is why Italy and France now, they start to uh, discuss uh, possibilities to increase this percentage because of the crisis right now, which, uh, which uh, tends to, to, to uh, become not only a health crisis, but also a financial and economic one. These levels were chosen somewhat arbitrarily, a deficit level of 3% of the GDP and a debt level of 60% of the GDP, already discussed. 
Now let's go to number 20, uh, 21. Slide 21. Criticism of the convergence criteria in the Eurozone. First, the rules involve asymmetric adjustments that take a long time. German preferences on inflation and fiscal policy were imposed at great cost on other countries. Tighter fiscal and monetary policies had to be adopted in countries like France, Italy, Portugal and Spain while they try to maintain the peg. Okay, leave it as it is. We will be discussing again and again about this issue. Second, already discussed actually, to a great extent. Second, the fiscal rules are seen as inflexible and arbitrary. Again, inflexible. During, I told you, during the financial crisis, German ministers, especially Mr. Schäuble, as the Minister of uh, Finance of Germany, insisted of maintaining the, 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 uh, the, um, uh, the um, rule of 3% of the GDP in, governance, uh, in government's uh, uh, deficit annually. Inflexible. The numerical, this does not apply to the US, by the way, okay? This does not apply to the US. Yes, uh, okay, if you have a problem with the internet, uh, you have just to go through the slides, okay? If there's a problem with the internet, you cannot hear. Just go through the slide, now, right now, discussed. Just read the slide. Uh, well, uh, the numerical targets have little justification and the well-established arguments of the prudent use of uh, counter-cyclical fiscal policy are totally ignored by the master criteria. Currently, discussion takes place towards reform of fiscal rules, really. Reform, not these strict regulations of 3 and 60%. Uh, third, do governments that subjected themselves to budgetary discipline and monetary conservatism really change or did they just go along with the rules to get in? This is a big issue. You know, the third point now, because we have uh, discussed a bit already about the first and second point. Now, the third point, one more common uh, explanation to that. Finally, <laughs> after two, I didn't understand. Yes, this is what I explain now, uh, Rima. Uh, this is what I will explain now. Uh, as long as you are not a member of the Eurozone, of course, and you have the interest to become a member, to join the euro and to adopt the euro as your national currency together with others, especially if you are a small country like Slovakia, Slovenia, Estland, uh, Latvia, uh, Greece, then you have to fulfill the criteria. The criteria are clear. You have to, uh, the, um, on the basis of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the former fiscal year, you have to fulfill these two criteria, 3%, of, uh, of uh, again, government deficit, 60% of overall debt. But once you have fulfilled the criteria, and, and the other criteria also, I mean, the other three criteria also, but once you have fulfilled, fulfilled all of them, then you become a member, okay? But after that, really, and this is, uh, there's enough evidence about this. I will tell you why. I mean, this, 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 the evidence is provided by the next slide, by the way, number 22, but not yet. Uh, once you're a member of the Eurozone, you don't care anymore to maintain, to maintain these rules or to, 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 to stick on the rules, to, uh, to respect the rules. You know, and you will understand why I'm saying this. Go to now to slide 22, there's a diagram, 22. Okay, this diagram now shows you to which extent countries of the Eurozone, this is not updated, this, uh, we have only 12 members. This, these are, by the way, the initial 12 members of the Eurozone as it started in 2002, okay? Now we have 18 members. But anyway, just to get an idea uh, what the problem is, once you get a member, you don't care about it anymore to, to maintain and to obey the rules, okay? So you can see here the red lines, they describe uh, the violations at least of the first criterion, which is to maintain a 3% or to, 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 uh, to, uh, 
to stay under the 3% of the GDP regarding your uh, annual deficit. All countries, you can see, Greece, 9.5%. Uh, even Germany, even Germany violated 5%. Okay? All of them, they violated. I mean, until 2005, 2000, uh, just before the crisis, 2007, all of them violated the rules. All of them. Uh, Germany was twice, uh, twice um, forced by the European Court of Justice to take action against the violation of the Eurozone rules. Not only Germany, but Germany especially, because Germany again dictates the rules. Even the rules dictated by Germany have not been respected by Germany itself. Okay. Okay, because there was a need for that, because there was a need of investment. But anyway, these rules are not respected by anybody. Once they are members of the Eurozone, this is the point. Well, uh, now, uh, we have two more things, two more slides for today. Here, if you go to slide 23. Slide 23. Sticking to the rules, again, this is a problem. It was a big problem until the crisis. Uh, within a few years of the Maastricht Treaty, the EU suspected the greater powers of monitoring and enforcement would be needed. This is why the, after that, after the Maastricht Treaty, this is not a, uh, this is not a, a legal provision by the Maastricht Treaty, it's, uh, is a legal provision, provision by the way, by the Treaty of Amsterdam in 1997, just before launching the Euro in 1999, namely the Stability and Growth Pact. This is how this legislation is, is called, the Stability and Growth Pact, uh, which the EU website has described, and this is now, <laughs> I cite this, of course, because of any, there's an intention behind this, I will tell you what kind of intention, and this is described in the next slide. But this legislation, this pact, Stability and Growth Pact, is described the concrete EU answer to concerns on the continuation of budgetary discipline in economic and monetary union. You know, this didn't succeed at all. Didn't succeed at all. If there's an EU policy that uh, failed, totally failed, and this was obvious finally by the beginning of the financial crisis, Euro crisis 2010, if there's a policy of the EU that totally failed, this is exactly stability and growth pact. And you can see on the last slide of today, slide number 24, shortcomings of this policy, um, stability and growth pact, surveillance failed, because member states concealed the truth about the fiscal problems like Greece. You know, the, uh, by the way, I now anticipate a bit the discussion we will uh, make uh, Saturday or Sunday. The whole thing began, the whole problem, the financial, the Eurozone crisis began in, the, in late 2009, December 2009, because they are uh, just elected newly elected two, two months ago, in, in October 2009, the new Prime Minister was elected in Greece, Mr. Yorgos Papandreou. And in December, just two months after his election, he, uh, he um, held a, 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 you know, an address to the people in TV, in Greek TV, by saying that we, are, we face a severe a household problem, and that our uh, overall debt, state debt, uh, exceeds to 120 percent instead of 60 percent. Nobody knew that because they concealed the truth about the fiscal numbers. The really, he confirmed that actually we have been cheating everybody regarding our numbers fiscal numbers. They have been speaking about 80-90% and it was 120. 
Well, uh, surveillance. And, and by the way, the, uh, he, he actually condemned in this, uh, in this address, condemned the European institutions, especially the European Commission, but they didn't monitor anybody uh, if they apply the policies they had to apply or not. And th this, this was right. I mean, surveillance fa failed totally. Okay, he was right. But this was, of course, not the only problem that, uh, you know, uh, Greece uh, uh, got these problems, financial problems. And punishment, this goes together, of course, as you understand. Punishment was weak. There was no punishment, actually. So even when excessive deficits, and this applies to everybody. You, you remember just before the, um, the diagram with the red lines by everybody. Uh, uh, so even when excessive deficits were detected, almost by all, not much was done about it. So once countries joined the Europe, the main carrot, encouraging them to follow the, uh, the rules, the budget rules, disappeared. Hence, surveillance, punishment and commitment all quite predictably weakened when, once the euro was up and running. Well, this was the last slide for today. This uh, was the unit we have to discuss about today. We will continue because, as you can see on slide 25, a new now uh, sub-chapter begins, namely the Euro crisis 2008-10. Actually, you have to correct this. This is not right. This is the global financial crisis, 8 to 10. I mean, the global financial crisis in some countries continued to exist after 2010, but uh, this is basically the period of time in which the global financial crisis took place. The Eurozone crisis actually, I would say, lasts from 2010 to 2015. This is the main period of the crisis, but definitely solved, I would say, in 2018, after Greece finally um, left all supportive mechanisms of the European Union and is still now one and a half years is now in the position to finance state finances uh, independently. Well, uh, this will be done then on Saturday. We will discuss these two slides, slide 25 to 34. Uh, we have 10. Yes, uh, actually in real terms until 2015, because this was the last agreement uh, about austerity measures between the European Commission the uh, European Central Bank and the IMF, the uh, International Monetary Fund, the so-called Troika during the crisis, the Troika, the agreement of them with Greece and the Greek government about austerity measures. So 15 to 18, uh, the Greek government finally applied these austerity measures. It was still a kind of crisis, not yet totally solved, because nobody knew what will finally happen with Greece, because the left government in Greece not everybody was sure that the left government will fully apply all these austerity measures. What finally the government did, indeed, the left government, uh, I would say far left even, they applied all austerity measures agreed upon with the Troika. But after the, uh, especially the political change in Greece uh, last year, with the new government now, the conservative government, uh, I would say 2018 is the end. Um, none of the local currencies before the euro was stronger than the US. Uh, one again, I, I couldn't read the whole the whole uh, comment or question. Can you please show me again, uh, Maher? I couldn't see the whole. I couldn't read the whole comment. Strong euro. Which which measures? Uh, I don't know which measures are meant.
Well, anyway, I now left the uh, I left the measures allowing countries to join the eurozone. Uh, yes, of course. I mean, you know, they ensure they ensure that uh, national economy is in the position uh, in terms of of debt, national debt, annual or overall, uh, is in the position to join the euro the eurozone. Uh, it secures that uh, national econ economy is is in the position regardless if you know regardless and this is now you know there are many issues connected to that because this is not only about the rules it has also to do with the fact which kind of economy joins the eu the, the eurozone and um, of course we have different different economies in according to those who are said okay yes 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 definitely but uh, you know there are m much more issues to be discussed i mean you know what 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 kind of economy is the slovenian one okay they fulfill you have to set some criteria you have to set some criteria and this is by the way i will tell you more on sunday about the best book in my eyes regarding the uh, eurozone crisis and this is exactly the, the the title one of the chapters of this book by the way written by a guy in, uh, in the uk a broker in the city a uh, greek background jason manolopoulos i will tell you more about the book my eyes the best book regarding the eurozone crisis especially the greek crisis of course uh, and one of the chapters of the book is entitled let's set some criteria <laughs> let's set some criteria i told you before three and sixty percent why not nine and uh, why not nine and ninety well but anyway this ensures that uh, everything can work well it worked well but not uh, but but in times with highly uh, liquid uh, uh, high high I will, uh, some extent, yes yes of course uh, uh, it was arbit uh, arbitrarily uh, defined or, and set um, but again it ensured a strong currency but in times of high liquidity and this uh, created Yes, and this created uh, finally problems. I will explain more and more. You know, we have to do that step by step. I cannot explain everything at once. Okay. Uh, now this was an overview actually, and this is still an overview from uh, 1945 at the Second World War, Marshall Plan, to the financial crisis that ends 2018. It's an overview, and we'll discuss. We will discuss more. I will, of course, pick up more important elements uh, on the basis of the second presentation we will start with uh, probably on sunday um, in terms of uh, these specific questions you might have okay regarding the crisis no it's the same crisis it starts 2010 okay it starts 2010 um, actually, 2009, December, but definitely then uh, 2010, in, uh, April, May, when first measures, first specific measures to face the crisis are launched by the European Union, the Europeans. Well, okay, uh, we have to stop here today. I hope, I hope you enjoyed the lesson. Uh, you learned things you didn't know yet and interesting things that you didn't know yet about uh, economic integration and problems uh, and solutions problems faced solutions given uh, we will be speak more about problems uh, on saturday actually because the uh, basic the last now unit of this presentation is about the uh, financial crisis and overview and we will continue, I guess, on, uh, we will see for how long we will have a lesson on Saturday. And we will continue very probably on Sunday with uh, the Eurozone as such. I mean, first we will see how the budget, by the way, how the budget is set in the European Union. We have first to discuss about this aspect, about the budget of the European Union, and then uh, about the Eurozone and the financial crisis, finally, and what kind of improvements in the meanwhile, we have in terms of better managing 
administering the monetary union. A lot of things have been done, by the way. A serious, very important achievements. Okay. You know, I have no time to read everything you you show me or you send me. Well, uh, if you have a specific question, by the way, if you have a specific question, because, you know, it's, it goes very, very quickly, I cannot, you know, uh, read everything, uh, you can send me this by email, okay, for the next lesson, okay? If you have a very specific question. But this is not an obligation, because you will uh, just... Uh, bombard me with questions, I don't, I don't want this. <laughs> so you have really a question, send me an email, in order to be discussed in uh, the next lesson. Well, again, we will meet again Saturday 10, 30 in the morning, okay? In order to continue the discussion and close this presentation, this overview of economic integration in the last now approximately 60 years in the EU. Okay, so thank you very much for attending and see you on Saturday. Juma Mubaraka. Yo Mukum Said. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will now close, thank you, thank you very much. I will close now the um, session, okay? So, see you on Saturday, guys. Have a nice time. Bye-bye.